Today we're going to have a look at this 1955 300SL Gullwing. Now, car guys, they tend to stick to their marks. You know, there's Ford guys, there's Chevy guys, there's guys who hate on Ferraris or Lamborghinis. But this car right here, it has to be one of the most universally loved cars. I mean, every major car collection worth its salt has one of these cars in it. We can't fully appreciate what this car is, until you hear the backstory of how Rudolf Uhlenhout rescued Mercedes from running second to the auto unions in the 30s. So Rudolf Uhlenhout, he gets hired by Mercedes in 31. He takes over the Formula One team, the Grand Prix team in 37 when they're running second and third and fourth behind the auto union cars. They dominate in 37 and 38. Rudolf's full steam ahead and then the war breaks out. Mercedes ends racing, racing ends in Europe. Rudolf stays on for Mercedes during the war, working on aircraft, all the time being followed closely by the Gestapo because of his dual citizenship. He was born in the UK to German parents. The war ends and he's running a trucking business for a few years, but he's got the racing bug. He goes back to Mercedes and wants to design a whole new race car for the 1950s sports car racing scene. Rudolf comes up with the W194. Under Rudolf's supervision, they build the W194 chassis, a tubular, proper race car chassis that weighs about 150 pounds. Then they start working on the body. They know that it has to have a super low drag coefficient if they're gonna run these big races like Le Mans with these giant straightaways, not to mention the back straight and the Nürburgring. The W194, is an engineering marvel. First, they built the tubular chassis and just threw a temporary body on it and went testing. Then when they went to build the body around the chassis and engine, they had to tweak a few things. Because of the high tubular sides of the chassis, they came up with the gullwing door, the classic gullwing door, to get around getting in and out of the car gracefully and they tilted the engine on its side pretty aggressively so that they could keep the profile of the hood pretty low. 1952 comes around and they're gonna go racing. They take the car out to its first race, the thousand miles, the Mila Miglia. Car finishes second. Then they go to the Bern Grand Prix. They finish first and second. Next is Le Mans, another one-two finish. Then the Nürburgring, where they finish first, second, third, and fourth. They absolutely dominate. The W194 is a massive success. Witnessing the success from across the pond is a guy named Max Hoffman. He was the Benz importer in New York. Max had a unique perspective being in the States. He saw the immense success that the W194 Gullwing was having over in Europe, but he also had a front row seat to the giant appetite that post-war America had for sports cars. So he called up the guys in Stuttgart and said, you guys need to turn that W194 into a sports car. I'll take a whack of them over here and I'm gonna sell them. So Mercedes decides to go ahead with the 300SL going. They take the engineer, Rudolf Uhlenhout, and they take a designer, Friedrich Geiger, and they put them together and this is what they come up with. The first car rolls off the line in 1954 and doesn't get shown in Stuttgart or anywhere else in Europe. It gets shown first at the New York Auto Show. The car is a huge success. They build 1,400 of these cars from 1954 to 57, with over 80% of them being sold in the US. Just so everyone appreciates how big a stud Uhlenhout was, while they were building this car, he was head of Mercedes racing. They were to win the 54 Formula One Championship and the 55 Formula One Championship. And there's a couple stories, although he was never a professional race car driver, he would hop in the Grand Prix car and turn times faster than the drivers, faster than Fangio. Then in 55, Uhlenhout would take the W196, tweak it, and turn it into the ultimate sports car, the 300 SLR Roadster. The car dominated the sports car events with Sterling Moss driving. If that wasn't enough, he managed to extricate two chassis and put a gullwing coupe body on them just so he could drive one of these cars to work. These cars are known as the Uhlenhout Coupe. If you haven't been paying attention to the news, it's the most expensive car on the planet. 
So they took the general idea from the Gullwing W194 race car, and with the W198, they tweaked a couple of things, I think improving the look. The first thing that you notice with this car here, obviously, is the color, Lindgren Green. All of these cars came standard silver, and it was actually a $65 option if you wanted any other color. There was a few other options with these cars. A Becker radio, the knockoff Rudge wheels, bumper guards, belly pans, leather seats, fitted luggage, competition springs, competition front and rear shock absorbers, a competition cam, and a different option for the ring and piston gears. Because these cars were race cars, and they gave them giant belly pans, which created huge downforce, sucking these cars down to the track, they needed a good solid way for the heat to escape from these engines. So they gave them these iconic gills on the side here. If you look through here, you can see right into the engine compartment. I mean, these things looked so cool and worked so well. The boys at Chevrolet definitely took note for the next decade. All right, let's hop in this thing. As you grab for the door handle, you start to see the aircraft influence that Rudolph brought to this thing. As you get inside the car, it becomes apparent. You open the door and you go to get in and you just see this giant sill. That's because of the tubular race car chassis that's underneath this thing. It really does feel like a race car as you go to step in. But it's a little bit daunting for guys who aren't race car drivers. So they wanted to help everyone out with the tilt steering wheel. Check this out. Getting in this car, although it looks like I'm going for a picnic, it's like I'm getting in a race car. Tilt the wheel back here. Close ourselves in here. Sitting inside this thing and hearing myself talk, it's ridiculous how sealed up this car is. So the second you sit in this car and you look around and you go to do anything, the aviation influence becomes completely apparent. None of these toggles or gauges or switches are labeled. And there's like 28 of them. All of the interior, although it's screwed in, it looks like aeroplane rivets. Even the little pocket for your belongings looks like it belongs on an airplane. The first thing you see in the manual is the handbrake. Because it's a race car, it's out of the way, down low here on the left. So although there was no air conditioning, there was a whole ton of venting options here. There's vents in the front that you open with a lever down here. That opens the air, pumping in fresh air into this tightly sealed cockpit. And the way it was relieved was actually through these openings in the back here. If you don't open this vent, you're getting zero fresh air in this cockpit. These cars are notoriously hot. Because of the curvature of the doors on these cars, you couldn't roll down the windows. It was either in or out. You could open them up, pop the windows out, and run with fresh air, but that's obviously not the fast aerodynamic setup. So you left the windows on and you opened your vent. By not labeling any of these, they gave the interior such a clean look. Also, if you didn't know what all of these did, you didn't own one of these cars. So you've got your instrument panel lights, you've got your parking selector switch, you've got your light selector switch, obviously your key, turn the ignition on, your windshield wipers, then you've got your passenger split, then you've got your climate control for left side and right side of the car, then you go here to your passenger horn, your cigar lighter, your windshield washer fluid. And then over here, you've got your right side leg ventilation and your right side windshield ventilation. On the driver's side, you've got your foot compartment ventilation and your left side windshield ventilation. Up here, you've got your reading light. There's a lot of toggles and switches on this dash here. And if you haven't taken the time to learn it, it's a little bit of a daunting task. The plaid seats and the luggage just complete the look on this car. This car's got both the plaid seats and the leather seat cushions as an option. While I'm sitting here, we should probably fire this thing up. So we'll turn the key on, fuel pump on. So 
So we'll go under the hood here next. Open up the hood here. Then just locks into place there. The quality of the restoration on this whole car is spectacular. But you open up the hood and look in the engine bay, and that point is really hammered home. When you open up the hood on one of these things, it becomes apparent just how much of an angle these engines are on. The engine in these things, the M198, a three liter inline six, putting out 215 horsepower and a top speed of 160 miles an hour, making it the fastest production car of its time. These things came fuel injected with a Bosch fuel injector and a dry sump, making it the ultimate track car of the day. Because of the giant belly pans on this car, you can't get down on one knee and look under it and really see anything. So this is your only viewing window into what makes this car so fast and so ahead of its time. You look down, you can see the tubular chassis everywhere. You look on the corners here. I mean, the thing looks like a modern race car. Four wheel independent suspension, four wheel disc brakes. It's no wonder this thing just dominated on the racetrack. When you look under the hood here, you start to see just a ridiculous number of stamps and tags. On the engine, there's a stamp and a tag. On the chassis, there's a stamp and a tag. The firewall has two tags. The spindles are stamped. The rear end stamped. The transmissions are stamped. So it's great from a collector's point of view. You can go to Mercedes still to this day and get a data card and all those numbers will be there. So if you reference, say for example, the spindles, and they're the original spindles, numbers matching, chances are the car wasn't in a wreck. Go in the trunk here. So you'd think the trunk would be the place for luggage, but no. This is where you're gonna fill the fuel, this is where the spare tire lives, the jack, and the hammer for the knockoff rudge wheels. Until you look underneath one of these cars, you don't realize just how large these belly pans are. Looking underneath one of these cars, I mean, other than the spindly little tires, it's like looking underneath a proper modern race car. The 300 SL Gullwing is the embodiment of the golden era of sports car racing. It's one of the most beautiful cars ever built, and it's absolutely mandatory in any serious car collection. So, We've got to ask ourselves, do you need a car like this? No. No one needs a 1955 Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing. But do you want a car like this? Oh yeah. Every car guy wants a car like this.